Hello and welcome back to my RC channel. I'm Andy RC and today I'm going to cover some unanswered questions about the DJI HD Digital FPV system. In my previous video I dove deep into the system with the intention to cover as much as possible and I think I achieved that. So I want to thank everybody for watching it and if you haven't seen it then I'll add a card to the top right of the video. I didn't receive the system and then put an initial thoughts video out because I think that can cause a knee-jerk reaction. For example, someone's emotional response alone could cause somebody to press the buy it now button without actually having any facts whether it's right for you or not. So even though I think I covered enough for individuals to either say yes this is for me or no it's not, there were some unanswered questions within that video itself and some new ones thanks to you guys asking them in the comments as well as some questions that have come from friends. So I'm going to answer them in this video. I think by this point in time people have picked a lane on what they think about this system and other systems so if you're here to voice your opinion on the politics or the business side of things of HD digital FPV then I'm going to politely ask you to go and channel that energy positively somewhere else. I don't click on videos that I don't want to watch or comment on them but I know where you're coming from and it's hard not to get into it but there is one reason alone why these new HD systems interest me whether it's DJI, Fat Shark, or anything else and it's not because I think or want it to replace analog because it's not going to however for a couple of years FPV hasn't changed that much and we live in a time where technology is booming so I'll be the first to admit that I've developed a short attention span and when things don't change I get bored. So when I hear someone say that a big company coming into FPV forcing people into a monopoly at gunpoint is going to kill off the hobby I find it kind of ironic because the truth is if you ask any YouTuber or business that's been around since the start of putting cameras on RC models they will tell you all in unison that there has been a downward trend in sales and a decrease in interest of FPV. There's also a further problem because the frequency of new products has actually gone up meaning there is more supply than demand and that is not good. But if you look through all of the noise, no pun intended, there are these nuggets of people and YouTubers who quit the hobby some time ago because of the reasons I've just mentioned. And they're now coming back to check out this new technology and that's a great thing. At the end of the day, it's us buying the product, so ultimately we are in control. People say I don't want to get locked into a closed proprietary HD system. Well then just don't buy it. Whether you fly analog, HD or line of sight, just embrace other people's choices and enjoy yours because you're not going to change their mind and they're not going to change yours. At this point I think we are lucky to even be considered for this type of technology given how much it has shrunk over the years and any spike of interest is going to benefit FPV because it puts us back on the radar and there's now the opportunity for some competition which always leads to innovation. That being said, one of the questions that keeps cropping up from people who have never flown FPV before but are watching all of these DJI Digital HD FPV videos is should I skip analog altogether and invest in DJI and to that I say absolutely not. You first want to master flying without breaking the bank and you can do this by buying packages such as the Ishin E013. It costs about 50 to 60 dollars depending if there's a deal or a coupon and you can practice the basics of hovering line of sight indoors and then move on to FPV because it's a full package for a very cheap price.
The hobby going stale is not the only reason people have quit either. They would see these big YouTubers making flying look easy, so they would go and buy all of the expensive stuff that they've listed in the video description, build it up, and then realize you actually have to learn how to fly. Otherwise, you have spent a lot of time and money, followed by about a 20 second flight that ends up with your model in bits. And that's enough for people to just give up. Believe me, I've seen it happen and I've heard far too many stories of it happening. There's another avenue to get started. You can buy a cheap transmitter such as the Flysky i6 and a dongle along with a simulator such as Velocidrone, Freerider or Liftoff and learn how to fly that way. If you can master either of those two options then it's time to get something like an Emacs Tiny Hawk and then after that you're going to want to learn how to build your own model whether it's a 3 inch or a 5 inch. This is really important because this is an area where people also end up leaving the hobby. They don't learn how to build or how to work beta flight. They buy a bind and fly off the shelf and yeah, maybe they can get it in the air. But if there's a problem with it or they crash it, they don't know how to troubleshoot it. And they've spent a lot of money and they just give up. So learning how to build and also how to tune and set up beta flight is important. And it's at that point that I would say you can then move on to this DJI HD stuff. So on to the next one, which isn't really an unanswered question, but it's an observation that I missed in my first video. I did mention that the camera's native aspect ratio is 4x3, which is my preferred viewing setting, so I didn't really explore the 16x9 option as much as I should have. But if you look back to this clip where I switch back and forth from 4x3 to 16x9, you'll notice that 16x9 mode actually crops the top and bottom of the image which loses vertical field of view. Not only that, but this was picked up by my friend Paul. When he observed the goggle view in 16x9 mode, he noticed more pixelization than in 4x3 mode. So while the 16x9 file recorded to the air unit doesn't get upscaled, it seems that the live feed through the goggles does when you select 16x9 mode. Now, it isn't devastating and the picture is still great, but you can notice the difference as essentially it's just zooming in on the 4x3 picture. So, for the best live feed, 4x3 is the way to go, in my opinion, because you also get the maximum vertical field of view, which many FPV pilots prefer, especially for racing. Then, if you want to use the air unit's HD footage, my advice would be to dynamically stretch it to 16x9 in post-production to give that GoPro look. The next one I want to cover is lockups. Some people are reporting that the DJI Air system isn't as good as analog because when the feed drops out, it just locks up with no warning. And this is something that I have not experienced, so I've done some testing on it. My experience is that when you start to push the range, the first indication is that focus mode becomes very noticeable. And that's when it's time to start backing out of what you are doing. If you are in uncharted territory, then don't go full guns a blazing into the situation either. Take it slow while finding the limits. Then if the latency gets too bad, just disarm. In my first video, I flew at a power output of 25 milliwatt and decided to fly behind some dense trees with the stock antennas and I still couldn't get it to lock up. It would go laggy for sure and it made the model really difficult to fly and in fact, I even crashed the model. But I think people experiencing these lockups are either using insufficient micro SD cards or they are using good micro SD cards, but they are quite old. If there's one thing that I've learned about making videos over the years is that micro SD cards wear out, which is why I stick to the SanDisk brand because they have a 30 year warranty. 
So if you have one that is failing or is getting corrupt files, then you can fill an RMA form on their website and provide the serial number that's written on the back of the micro SD card and they'll replace it with a brand new one. I've heard a couple of people say that removing the SD card from the air unit has stopped these lockups. So I can only come to the conclusion that this is the cause because I'm yet to have this problem. My experience is that the image quality always degrades and the latency increases, which is your warning to back out of whatever you are doing or land. I do wonder with bigger rigs if you have connected the air unit direct to the VBAT that a large punch out could starve the air unit of current causing it to reset also known as a brownout because people are reporting the lockups like the air unit has been unplugged and it can take around 15 seconds to get the signal back which to me is not an indication of signal loss but an indication of power loss. So for the next subject, in my initial review I mentioned that the air unit is best suited to multi-rotors due to its integration with Betaflight, but I'm told that it's also working with iNav and I've heard some rumours that it works with KISS as well. Now I haven't tried iNav or KISS and I'm not sure how it works with the MSP option with KISS. I know iNav is similar to Betaflight. The biggest problem though is that at present the system doesn't even require the flight controller to have an on-screen display chip so things like GPS information can't be put on the screen but it's good news because I've had it confirmed that they are working on getting the full on-screen display integrated into the DJI system eventually. Although someone told me that they have GPS rescue mode on a switch and they use the voice commands on their controller to tell them when it's active. So it's not completely unusable with GPS. It's just very limited at the moment. Now I wouldn't call the Fat Shark Bite Frost a competing system because in my eyes it's doing something completely different than the DJI system and I'd love to try one out. One thing that the Bite Frost can do is report your controller's RSSI back to you and it's true that if you are using an aftermarket transmitter with the DJI system you currently can't show its RSSI. However, if you are using the DJI controller, then its control link and video link are one in the same. So your video channel strength is also your controller's strength. There are some advantages and disadvantages to this, which I hope to cover in a different video where I go full DJI. So look out for that coming soon. But in another way, you can use Crossfire and you can use the R9 system from FR Sky and using those two control systems in conjunction with the DJI system it's more likely that the video will cave in before the control system. Another unanswered question in my first video was regarding a phenomenon with analog called IMD which is an acronym for intermodulation distortion and since this was discovered a lot of analog drone races are no longer using race band. You see, race band initially was set up to give larger separation between frequencies so that more quads could fly in the air at the same time. However, it turns out that with analog, you can be on two channels spaced so far apart that they shouldn't interfere with each other. But when transmitting together, they create a third frequency. So if you are a racer, you may have heard races run on IMD6 or IMD4 with 6 and 4 being the number of models that can fly together on particular frequencies that won't interfere with each other. There's a website that has done a lot of work on this called ethalley.com where you can find a tool that allows you to enter frequencies and it will do the calculations for you to show you which two frequencies used together will create this third frequency causing problems with analog. So I put both CE and FCC frequencies of the DJI system into this tool and the red boxes show a conflict 
for almost all of the frequencies that they have chosen with this DJI system for their channels. So I asked the question to DJI whether digital FPV suffers from IMD and the simple answer is no. Rotor Riot as well as others have successfully run eight of these DJI systems together at maximum power output without any issues. So for America, this could be a pretty big deal for racing. You see, the majority of the world is limited to 25 milliwatt by law, but in countries where the full 700 milliwatt is allowed, they only run races at 25 milliwatt because of this IMD issue as well as analog swamping out the band when you up the power but digital doesn't do that so I can see a time where races could be conducted in full HD and at full power this unfortunately can't be the case in other countries where the power as well as the number of channels are limited by law unless some kind of special permission is granted or the law is changed it might not be the end of the road for us though. I'm lucky enough to have been told by DJI the function of each individual antenna on both the air unit and the goggles. So I'm currently working to find out the best antenna combination that is best for 25 milliwatt. There are people out there trialing different antennas already. I know the True RC XR antennas for the goggles and the Axi V2 antennas for the air unit have seen big improvements on 25 milliwatts. However, Understanding why that is might not be best for every situation. There might be some better options. So I hope to find a definitive answer to that. And I welcome your input on what antennas are working best for you, as well as the kind of spots that you are flying at, because it might be key in getting the best out of the system. Another question that cropped up is to do with the air unit and if you have more than one of them, does it retain the settings of each unit? And the simple answer is yes. So any setting changed through the goggles is transmitted and stored on the air unit. So for example, you could have left one air unit in 16x9 mode and another in 4x3. But when you switch between the two, they will automatically change to their own settings by transmitting the data back to the goggles. One of the biggest complaints of the goggles is the foam faceplate. They fit my face fine with a little bit of light leak from the back, but other people actually find them really uncomfortable. This is nothing new with FPV goggles as everyone's face is a different shape. You can certainly 3D print some spaces from Thingiverse, and I've heard rumors about DJI producing different foam plates, but I can't get that confirmed anywhere at the making of this video, but it's something that I hope they do pursue. Finally, I asked DJI if they have any plans to release a ground station or some sort of device that can send a live feed to something other than their own goggles, and this is the answer that they gave me. We've certainly heard the feedback about HDMI output, and we are working on solutions for this. That was exactly what they said. So I can only see that as a positive thing. So there you go. I'm going to wrap the video up there. If you have any further questions, then put them in the comments in the below and I'll try to answer them as best as I can. And as always, thanks so much for watching. Please continue to subscribe. Cheers.